Yeah, g'day, listener. It's my fault. We couldn't do a recording this week because I had to go and visit my marmalade manufacturing interests in Tenerife. Nice. Good marmalade, bad marmalade. All good, but okay. different kinds of marmalade. And you can't do that remotely. A Zoom call does not help you test the textures and the flavours of the marmalades. So instead, listener... We are giving you a recast of an episode that is basically every Venn diagram of everything we're into. So it's got medical experiments. Uh, yeah, urine. Urine. Injections. Uh, nice, nice. Some uh, animal experiments, but in a really nice way. Nirvana lyrics. Nirvana lyrics. Mental uh, health. Australian scientists. Slightly historical, but not too far back. And a weird, weird quirk, that the fact that one of the most effective uh, – Drugs for depression is the third smallest element you can get. Like, that just blows my mind. I'm going to begin as I begin uh, pretty much all my lectures. At the beginning? Yeah. In the beginning was the word? And the word in this instance is, of course, spoken word. Is this what I do? Uh, I, know, I know you know this about me, but you know, non-regular listeners may not. You may or may not recognise this. I'm so happy because today I found my friends. They're in my head. Oh. I'm so ugly. That's oh, yes. Okay. Yes, of course. It's Nirvana. Because so you are. Did you meet that band? Oh, we'll get to that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Broke our mirrors. Sunday morning is every day for all I care, and I'm not scared. Mm. Light my candles in a day. I've just got to say, your, your rendition is beautiful. It's better than it. It's uh, spoken word. But there's well, – okay, yes, it is spoken word. Because I found God. <laughs> What? I'll get to the next bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it goes on. So, as you recognise, it's from the Hindu prog rock band um, Nirvana. Do you recognise the song? Mm. What's it called? Uh, I, look, <laughs> in, in my defence, in my defence, I put, back in the day when I listened to a lot of Nirvana, it was on the CD. Now I listen to it on the on the Apple Music. And I would put a CD in and that would be, I, I, I think that is track, th it's it's number three. That's how like, I know music like, too. Yeah, it's track four. <laughs> songs don't have names no, I agree. unless they say them over and over again in the chorus. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this one. So it's the song Lithium. Oh, there you go. That's, I, um, yes. Yeah. And so basically, I'm just going to, I know you haven't heard this before. I'm just going to tell you about how, you know, when I hung out when I met Nirvana, because I know you've never heard that before and you love it when I do. But when I finish with that, we're going to talk about lithium. Welcome, Welcome. to The Wholesome Show. Science stories for you, if you maybe sit up the back of the class, if you're more like, um, you know, you, you like to learn, yeah. but maybe you don't want to be seen like one of those suck-ups next to the teacher. No. And if you're a suck-up and you're here, to, that's cool. That's cool. We love you too. Mm. Um, we, just, don't, we don't love you in a weird way though. We love you in no, a respectful yeah, sure, way. Sure, sure. But experiment with being the dead shits up the back of the class who <laughs> like to like to crack jokes, you know, they pass messages, smoke a bong. Exactly. Those people up the back of the class, this is the podcast of science for you. And we ask the questions that those people would ask so that all you who sit up the front don't have to. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. And me, uh, Dr. Roderick Griffin. I met Nirvana and you didn't. Lambert. Let's talk about lithium. Lithium, yeah, tell me about it. Because who doesn't love a metal? It's a metal? It's the lightest metal of the periodic. I period. knew it was light because hydrogen, helium, lithium. It's yeah, like yes. atomic element number three. I got to memorise all the way up to three. So it's uh, yeah, atomic number three, lightest of the solid elements. So, so it's not a gas. It's just light. It's light metal. Yeah. But you can, you can make like a tin out of it. You can make a metal object out of it. Out of pure lithium? Yeah. It would have a tendency to burst into red flame if it came, <laughs> if it was pure and got anywhere near heat and stuff. Okay, all right. It's so, a little reactive. So in a vacuum, you could do this. Yeah, or you just mix it with shit. But it's it's basically found naturally in anything like rocks, soil, bodies of water. So it's around. Okay. Yeah. It's but it's only point. There we go. Point zero zero zero. Let me guess. Wait. Percent. Oh no, I was going to guess. You were going to say seven. I was going to. I was going to say yeah. seven. Yeah. It's soft, silvery white. As I said, it's highly reactive, flammable. Flares into a bright crimson, so it's pretty. It's good mm. in fireworks and stuff. Okay. 
But you've got to store it in a mineral oil, otherwise it goes poof. So you can have a tin, but you'd have to have a your tin. Yeah, have some mineral oil around the, the tin. Oil. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a standard tin or a rucksack. Yeah, and so you put the tin in like a Tupperware container yep. with mineral oil. Yep. And so, yeah, you can put yep. your baked beans in there, but it's yep. not that useful. That's how you do it. That's how I've always, that's how I carry baked beans when I'm carrying them with me. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, along with hydri- hydrium, I was going to say, hydrogen helium. Um, and that one's number one and two. Just if, if, if anyone's doing the count here. Apparently hydrogen, helium, and lithium are the only elements created at the birth of the universe. Yeah. I know. But according to the Big Bang Theory, or however you want to word it, the universe should hold three times as much lithium as can be accounted for, at least in the older stars. So there's missing lithium? Yeah, there's missing lithium. Oh. It yeah. seems. Dark lithium. Yeah. Anyway, so the Brazilian naturalist and statesman, and I, I know you, you know the name, but I'll tell others. Yeah, cool, cool. José Bonifacio de Andralde e Silva. You know, you know. Jose. Yeah. He um, discovered the mineral petalite uh-huh. or patilite. I assume it's petalite. Yeah. But patilite sounds far more exotic. I love the patilite with the, with the piquant sauce. Uh, that's actually lithium, alloy, siliconio, oxygen, something. It's long. Uh, it's There's a lot in it. It's a, a, more, a more chemistry thing. So yeah. some sort of yeah. mineral. Yeah. And he found it on a Swedish island in the 1790s, the island of Utu. I like the I like the reverse colonialism there. That uh, yeah. someone from the colonies has gone and mined mined Europe at that point. Yeah, they backed that shit up. Uh, in eighteen seventeen, so a little bit later, Swedish chemist Johan August Afwedson. Yes. Uh, he discovered that patilite or petalite contained a previously unknown element. Oh, did he? But he couldn't quite isolate it perfectly. He only got one of the salts out. Lithium by triple salt. Yeah. Salty lithium. Salty lithium. So it was first isolated, and best I could tell, either in 1821 or 1855. <laughs> One or the other. You know what that is? You know what that is? Is yeah. 1821, they did it. 1855, they did it as well. But they did the lit review after they did the did yeah. the work. Yeah. And they're like, oh, fuck. Oh, Whoopsie, oh, well, just claim just it. Don't tell your supervisor. Don't tell your supervisor. Well, one of them just was, say you did the lit one review. One of them was Robert Bunsen. One of them was Robert Bunsen, the chemist, and he's more famous. Inventor of the burner. Yeah, no, he, yeah, he invented the Robert. <laughs> So they electrolysisalized lithium chloride to separate it out. Okay. So we flash forward, 1923 in Germany, they started commercially producing lithium. To do what? Commercial stuff. Um, <laughs> for example, first fully man-made nuclear reaction was, was based on lithium, transmutation of lithium atoms into helium in 1932. Oh, really? Mm. There you go. You also can use lithium deuteride, which comes from this uh, transmutation, in um, fuel for staging thermonuclear weapons. The first major application of lithium was in high-temperature lithium greases. Well, of course, you in got lithium any, grease. Got any lithium grease? Uh, high-temperature lithium. I need some li- Is this for cooking your sausages yes. super quick? And and lubricating aircraft engines and shit in World War II. Okay. During the Cold War, the demand for lithium dramatically increased because, you know, nuclear fusion and stuff. The US became the prime producer of lithium in the late 50s cool. and up into the mid-80s. So lithium-ion batteries increased demand for lithium quite a lot in the ah, they do too, early yeah. 2000s. So lithium-ion became very popular. You've probably heard of it. I have. I have. I've, I've got a battery that is lithium-ion. Do you? Yeah. Do you keep it in a cabinet so that no thieves can steal it? I keep it inside my things. Apparently nowadays, Chile and Australia produce the most lithium cool. in the world. But I won't talk about any of that. I want to talk about lithium and health. Thank fuck. Lithium, lithium and health. Health. So many people have thought of, you know, the, they believed in the curative properties of, of metals. mineral waters. Metals. Yeah, yeah. Eat some metal. Yeah. You need more iron in your diet. They don't mean, like, eat a car. Well, there's that French guy that did. He, uh, he, uh, bicy- oh, he ate a car, didn't he? And a plane. A, he got to a plane? He got to a plane. Like, in shavings in his i, I got I got to tell you, listener, I looked up this guy to do a Wholesome Show episode Gross. on it. And then I got to the end, I was like... There's no story except a sad guy that spent his life eating eating metal and bombed um, engine parts for the rest of his days. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, oh. and oh, like he did it for entertainment. And he probably had an okay life. I don't think he died of it. Um, but uh, this is this is this is a very broad definition of entertainment. <laughs> I'm bored. I'll eat a plane. I'm, I'm bored. I'll watch someone eat a plane. Like that, I am. See that that makes sense because it's on television. No. It's on a screen. It, it took him two years to eat the plane, so it wasn't. It wasn't like he sat down like Cookie Monster and crunched through the <laughs> oh, plane nom, 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 nom. in like four seconds. Me I get, mean that me passenger that I would really watch. I would Cookie really Monster eat a plane. Yes, or yes, I, I would really, anything. really watch that. That's one of the stories I'm not doing today. Yeah. So mineral waters have been something that people are into for years, for, for <laughs> millennia. Are they actually? I mean, I know I, I thought it meant like of like from a mineral spring or something. Yeah, like, a miney water. Yeah, from mines. Oh well, yeah, things what bubble up. Yeah, 
And so they been a lot of them would have naturally occurring lithium salts in the groundwater, and so it would congeal in these mineral springs. Okay. So the ancient Greeks, Romans, Native Americans would bathe in mineral waters, and they would attribute healing properties to the mineral springs, which yeah. likely contained lithium as well. Health spas. Yeah, man. Um, Soranus of Ephesus was a medical doctor from the second century. He prescribed mineral waters for people who were manic and had other psychiatric problems, but also for shitloads of other things. <laughs> Yeah, so stuff. But but like like all doctors <laughs> of the second century, they had one one remedy, and they said use that for everything. Use this, yeah. yeah. Take leeches. It, yeah, you nearly sprained your fingers doing <clears throat> those air quotes. That was a big one. Doctors out. So in the late nineteenth and into the early twentieth century, lithium was basically seen as a cure all. And it was, so they knew it was lithium that was um, in the health spa water? Or else it was, I mean, one article I read called it the turmeric of the late eighteen hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> so. Unless you're listening to this well into the future, turmeric is uh, quite popular in health, health conscious circles. Do they bathe in it though? No, this is drinking it now. This is consuming okay. it. So they'd add it to pretty much everything. So it was it was common for companies, of course, to bottle spring water, etc. But my favourite was lithium citrate, Ooh, which in is your, in your lemon juice. Oh, kinda. It's in an indigestible salt form. It was in the original Seven Up recipe. Oh, really. The, the soft drinks we have now all came from these ultra-wacky pasts. Yeah, cocaine, like, lithium, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, This one's got heroin and live <laughs> pigs in it. You know, it's great. Swallow a live pig with your bubbles. I also love it. was originally called, when it was first marketed, 7-Up seven seven up was called, Bib Label Lithiated Lime and Lime Soda. Yeah, I get why they changed that. Can you I, imagine the ad? you got the woman in the bikini as they used to have a 7-Up <laughs> ads. Come and get your Bib Label Lithiated Lime and Lime Soda. Bib Label. Bib Label. Bib Label. I don't. I don't know. I just don't know. Do you think it was a long committee meeting where they decided to change, or the, really or the, short or the new name? I've got a name. Done. <laughs> well, each one said one, two, three, four, four. They knew they were going to call it soda, and then five people got to add a word. <laughs> um, that was launched in twenty nine, nineteen twenty nine, nineteen forty eight. They stopped adding the lithium citrate. So it was, it was until then anyway. It was thought of as a health drink. Now I confess, a chunk of the stuff I'm going to tell you about comes from uh, a piece in News dot com. I'm not proud, but it was a review of a book by someone who actually has a brain. So this is not all that, that only comes from there. But so lithium as a as a cure, at least as a treatment for particular de- you know, particularly depression and bipolar, or what used to be known as manic depression, is still a thing. But where did it begin? Mm. So it begins in 1912 in country Victoria. Really. Australia. Are you serious? Yeah. I thought it was Franny Fisher's murder mysteries and not much else in country Victoria in 1912. Yeah, no, no, but you thought it was going to be a Swedish island with Spaniards. I did, I did. For Guano. Or at least the Germans, who were very happy to experiment with things in the 1920s. I thought, yeah. They they weren't the only ones, though, to be fair. So, Doctor, we wasn't a doctor then. John Cade was born in 1912. His father was a GP. And when he was little, his father buggered off to World War One, served in Gallipoli and in France. So he got he got the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, when he came back, he was suffering oh. from what they were calling war weariness. You're a bit tired, mate. That's what it is. How was the war? Fuck, you, I'm napping. You probably didn't have enough sleep during yeah, the war. Yeah. Maybe if you have a bit more have sleep rest. now, yeah. then you'll be fine. How much would you like? I'd like infinity, please. Um, no, he didn't kill himself. But he had difficulty continuing his GP practice. So he, he ended up working... <sighs> I was just, just thinking about the, the oh. ways that they didn't treat PTSD after that war. Yeah. And it's not like they're better after and more recent since, wars. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. But at least they acknowledge it and know. I know that we're still dealing with a lot of not dealing with that after Afghanistan and things like we that. We are dealing with a, not, a lot of not dealing with that. So his father sold his practice and he, he got a job with the mental hygiene department. <laughs> I love that. That's a great name. You are mentally dishygienic. So over the next 25 years, he became the doctor, the, the dad Cade Senior, became a medical superintendent at a bunch of Victorian mental hospitals. Okay. So he got over his war weariness, enough, oh, totally at kidding. least enough that he can he can have a job. and He'll help other people. And his family, would they'd live on campus as such. They'd live on the campuses of the hospitals. So as a young boy, uh, John Cade would go from asylum to asylum. As, as This is how it was written. That's a cool upbringing. Uh, That's so doing? cool. No, but apparently so he, he would see mentally ill patients every day of his life, at least as a child, says... um a psychiatrist who is an author of a, a book about him. And I know that they did vary enormously, like those sorts of yeah. institutions. You yeah, could have you did. could have a, 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 a good, benevolent, well-meaning director, um, or you could have other. You uh, could also have a good and benevolent, well-meaning director who did terrible things because yeah, they no doubt. thought they no were doubt. doing the right thing. But remember, this is like pre-1940s. This is not a great time to be mentally ill. There never is a good one, but that would have been worse. 
So, um, yeah, according to this psychiatrist guy called Greg Damore, who wrote a book about John Cade, lithium, etc., um, and he said, look, basically to Cade as a child, instead of being objects of curiosity or people to fear, the mentally ill that he saw, he regarded them as friends. He became used to them and they, oh, were, cool. they were people. That's nice. Which is cool, yeah. That's why he was actually Certainly, normalized. yeah, not the, not the common attitude of the time. Yeah. So he studied med, uh, medicine at University of Melbourne. He became a house officer at St. Vincent's Hospital. I assume that means resident doctor. Then he went to the Royal, Royal Children's Hospital. And then he became severely ill with bilateral pneumococcal pneumonia. That's a lot of penews. While he was convalescing, he uh, fell in love with one of the nurses called Jean. And in 1937, they got them married. But this is very much a 1930s story. Isn't it? You're convalescing in a hospital, you fall in love with the nurse. Yeah. That's just yeah. what you do. It's the English patient. So they fell in love, loved each other, married in 1937. He became a captain in the Australian Army Medical Corps, or the AIF, what is it? Australian Infirm Forces. Infantry Forces? Infantry. Idiot Forces? I doubt it. Anyway, July 1940, he um, was posted to the uh, a field ambulance unit and he was trained as a psychiatrist, but he served as a surgeon and wandered off to Singapore in 1941. Uh-huh. So that went well. He was captured. Oh. And a prisoner of a war in Changi for three and a half years. That's horrible. So anyway, he was the only psychiatrist in that area and they set up a little uh, kind of medical thing, the Australians and the British, within, within the um, prison camp. Mm-hmm which is a surprise. So he started up a mental health unit. And until now, basically, the standard wisdom was serious mental illness was because you had a poor upbringing or bad morals, etc. It was the 40s. Yeah. All right. On all average, right. that, was the, that was the position. So Kate started observing patients and, and folk. I suppose really everyone in Changi was a patient in some way. And they had similar symptoms to the ones he'd treated and seen before the war. And he started thinking, wait, I think there's something else going on here. And what he observed, according to his biographer, was that serious mental illness could be caused by biological changes, like changes in the chemistry or the the structure of the brain. Not just bad upbringing. Yeah, or or wicked morals, believing in the wrong God or the wrong version of the same God. But instead it can be something chemical. Yeah. Okay. They didn't think that before? Not often. They didn't think that before? I mean, look, I think this is is fairly broad. And to be fair, the biographies that we're talking about this guy... Written by Australians, this guy's an Australian god, so I think there might have been a little liberty. The, the word hagiography did come up okay, occasionally. Fair enough, so, fair enough. Uh, but so that's what it seems. On the whole, that wasn't, un, that wasn't common to think of mental illness as being anything other than you know dirty, naughty things. So he would do autopsies on the patients of people who died and had problems, and he'd find physical causes like blood clots. This is clots. while he's still in Changi? Yeah, still in yep. Changi. So he'd find blood clots and stuff in the brain and kind of go, okay, this one was particularly messed up. And they behaved weirdly and they got blood clots. Uh, okay. This yeah. is organic. This is biological. And he started thinking that illnesses like schizophrenia and manic depression might actually have organic or physical causes. That's an amazing thing to think. I mean, like, yeah. like the shift in thinking. I, yeah. I get that we are very much okay with that kind of thing now, like, like Ooh, that there's yeah. some sort of chemistry going on and you, your chemistry can be unbalanced. Mm. And so as, as it's been put, this idea took root and it incubated while he was still not back in Australia. He didn't publish any journal articles while he was in Changi? Yeah, yeah, the Changi Journal. I, I would have thought you should, three and a half years, you'd get a couple out. Yeah, I would have thought lazy. Not a real academic. Oh. Not going anywhere. So in 1946, as he, he came back to Australia and it was as it was put, he was on a mission. And later in life, he wrote about this time, I returned from three and a half years as a POW of the Japanese, mourning the wasted years and determined to pursue the ideas that had germinated in See, that I, time. See, I have not been in a prison camp. Yes, there would be things I'd want to do when I come back, but mostly I'd be thinking, I want, I, I'm thinking of the delicious meal, yeah. and I'm thinking not of... Not being beaten. Uh, yeah, that one, yes. Not wondering if I was going to get having, killed Having an day. awesome shower would be nice. Oh, God. Um, I get oh. career aspirations are coming, are coming back, but I'm not sitting there going, no. you know what, you know what, I want to... Do it on a mission. Yeah, fair, this, good on him. This guy was into it. So at the time, you'd be amazed here, 1946, there weren't really any effective treatments for people with severe depression or bipolar conditions. Amazing, right? Mm, I am who, amazed. Who would have thought? Um, so basically going into an asylum was the only option, which wasn't cool. And the biographer who writing about Cade said, look, the, the patients would often remain frozen and weird and locked up in their depressive states for quite a while until the symptoms maybe thawed or re- they returned to normalcy. Put them there and see. Let's see what I happens. Mean, what's the worst yeah. going to happen? We'll you know, lock them up for a while. Yeah. They're protected. Yeah. And then maybe they'll just get better yeah. on their own. Yeah. It was after a year they imagined they'd get better and that it was he added the addendum if they survived that year. If, if. So, so it wouldn't go well. Oh, did they have an attrition rate that was above zero per year? It was above zero. So Cade thought that mania was caused by an excess of a naturally occurring substance in the body. He wasn't sure what it was. And depression was caused by having a deficiency of the substance. So after the war broke out, he worked at the Bandura Repatriation Mental Hospital near Melbourne. Yeah. 
and there, there was with the ex-soldiers who were incarcerated with their mental illness. I love the word incarcerated, uh, but they were. They were locked yeah. up for, with their mental illness stuff. But, of course, at the time, there were no imaging devices to look at the structure and size of the brain when talking 1946. Mm-hmm. Doing a bunch of blood tests was pretty intrusive and gross, but also they didn't really know what to look for. Yeah. So he had to find a way to look for this hypothesized substance. Man- maniacum. Yeah, maniacum. This, this is us guessing that. That's not yeah, here. no, it's not that's the official it. name, but it will be. They'll change it. We'll, we'll, we'll write a paper. No, we won't. No, we won't. Um, so the solution is pretty obvious. Obviously, he turned to... Uh, magic? Urine. Well, <laughs> of course, of course. It's me. <laughs> turned to piddle. <laughs> I didn't what, know this. What can we this. get out of people easily? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and they even, no matter how sick you are, you tend to do the wee-wees. Mm. So Cade reckoned that if mania was due to an excess of a chemical circulating in the body, then maybe some excess of that would be piddled out and he could measure it. Well, wouldn't that be the problem, though, if you're weeing out too much of it? You whittle out yeah, too okay. much to un- unmanium. So um, he thought, well, I can get the wee-wees and I can measure it and see what it might be. So his wife, Jean, says, um, she remembers the start of his husband's experiments. He came to me and he said, I've got to do some research on why these patients have got different illnesses. I'd like to find the melancholias first, depression and other illnesses, as they were referred to, the melancholias. I've got an idea that might come to something if I save a lot of jars. <laughs> we need, we'll be eating the prune jars. Come yeah, on. We need a lot of jars. And, and she said at first she didn't know why he needed them. So anyway, he started accumulating jars. Like he'd travel to Melbourne and buy buttloads of bulky glass jars. <laughs> like buttloads, apparently. His wife, Jean, wasn't particularly stoked and she First would say to him, we don't jars. have any money, dude. And I kept telling him, we don't have any money, why are you buying these jars? His reply was, we might be able to use them afterwards for pickles. Oh, just, <laughs> <laughs> So as soon as he had enough jars, which is N jars, mm-hmm. he started to fill them with urine he got from his patients. Mm-hmm. And he didn't have a lab at first, so he's working out of his garage and in the backyard. Come into my garage and take yeah, a piss. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you taking the piss? No, I'm keeping it. Eventually, he moved to an empty pantry in a new ward that was built just behind the hospital. I would have thought he would be yeah. doing it closer to the hospital, but anyway. Well, he was close. He's only 100 metres away from the hospital. Oh, anyway. Okay, all right. So there was an empty pantry, and so no one was using the ward. He moved into the pantry. <laughs> and everyone used to call this lab the shed, because it's Australia. To get from his house to the shed, it was a short stroll. He'd go through the back fence, past a chook pen, along a gravel path. Boom, he's at his, at his that shed. Is, that is very Australian science. A, a thousand percent. But he needed one more thing before he could do his, his stuff properly, which was something to keep the wee-wee cold. So he started using the family fridge. No. no yes. No. no. Yeah. So he each patient's urine was decanted into screw-top bottles and jars, numbered and shelved. <laughs> uh, every time anyone from the Cade family opened their frigidaire door, <laughs> there would be a whole bunch of jars oh, of, of twinkle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, oh, fuck me. How do you put it? Oh. The stored jars of twinkle of several dozen mentally ill men would confront them. I don't know if it's better if it's your own or a family member. but Your own urine? Yeah. I'm trying to process no. here. There's a little bit of me that says if it's mine, at least I'm responsible. You know, I know where it came from. And, and if it's within the family, it's like, okay, that's that's gross, but we know the source material. But yeah. like a stranger's urine is somehow worse for me. I don't, I, know. I, oh, I don't know. Maybe not knowing helps me. No, it doesn't help me. <laughs> I can imagine it's something else. <laughs> All right, so flip this around. Okay. So Desert Island, whose pee are you, drink? are you drinking a stranger's or are you drinking your own or are you drinking a friend's and you've monitored their diet? Mine first. <laughs> there you go. Okay, who's second? Because I figure it's already been in me. It must be fine. Yeah, there you go. I know there are problems. All right, are you drinking argument. a family member's or are you drinking a stranger's? Thank Christ most of my family are dead. <laughs> uh, look, by the time I'm um, screwed up enough to drink urine, I don't think I'd give a shit. I don't want strangers wee in my fridge. I don't want anyone's wee, but strangers is worse. <laughs> well, apparently Gene and his two sons became quite used to it. So it was standard behaviour. You push aside a bottle or a couple of bottles of urine to get to the cheese. You can get used to anything, you can't can. you? Well, the quote from one of the sons was, to us it was all normal. We wouldn't have known whether everybody else did or didn't have urine in their fridges at home. <laughs> you wouldn't have known. No, yeah. They, look, yeah. Why, why is your fridge so empty of the yellow jars? Mm. Like our, our fridge has heaps Where of Where do you keep your dad's piss? Yeah. So, okay, he's got heaps of piss now. He's got heaps of wee-wee. What now? I don't know. Do some science on it. Like, he, oh. shouldn't he have started doing science, like, straight away? Oh, In fact, no, he wanted to have enough Why do you need to store it for ages material. before? Why don't you get it from the gentleman or gentlewoman, uh, take it to your lab, yeah. do the science on it, and then tip so it out. So he doesn't have a lab. He's got the pantry. In so the he's shed. just storing at the moment. Well, you've got to be ready. Uh so he had no he had no equipment to analyze the urine, and even if he did, he didn't know what he was looking for. So he did the obvious thing: start looking for anything. 
Oh, no, even more obvious. He got a bunch of guinea pigs mm. from a nearby um, Mont Park Asylum. You, probably, you visited uh, well, there Are we talking these are real guinea pigs, yeah? Real actual guinea pigs, little creatures that the uh, South American countries eat. Mm. And he caged them up in his newly acquired lab, the pantry. And is he going to make them drink some... I'll get to that. So his son, David, still treasures the memory of walking into the pantry and seeing his father with all the guinea pigs. <laughs> Dad, you're covered in guinea pigs. What a great day. I love my childhood. His quote, uh, the guinea pigs were in cages, but we also had some at home. They got through a lot of kitchen scraps. I remember Dad hand, handing one of them on his left arm and stroking it. They were tame from constant handling. They were good looking. Sure. Tan, black, white. My favourite was a tan and brown one. That's one of the sons. His wife, Jean, reminisces. We had guinea pigs in the shed, lots of guinea pigs. As they died, we'd get some more. He was good to them. He'd call them darling, and he'd say, don't you mind me doing this, as he injected them. With? So he would hold them on their backs carefully and inject the urine into their ab- abdomens. No. Oh, yeah. No. Why are we... Why are we do, why, this isn't science. To help people. This is not science. Like, you don't seem well. I'm going to inject piss into this guinea pig. You'll be fine. <laughs> you got to have a big correlation diagram. Too. Like, well, you very, know, very you know it's, it's like uh, patient Gary, guinea pig, uh, Chelsea. And then yep. Uh, yep. and then we put a bit of uh, Griselda into, yep. Yep. Oh, into Keith. What coloured guinea pigs too? I mean, that, that's probably going to be important. <laughs> so you're not mixing? You're not, you know, you know put a, a couple of people into A little into bit a, of Bill, a little bit of Sadie. Why are we injecting it? You can make guinea pigs drink stuff. That's gross. No. No, he's just being gross. So he was experimenting to see if the urine from manic patients might affect guinea pigs differently to urine from other patients. Okay, so so we've got some control guinea pigs and some control urine. Finally, there's some science. Yeah, okay. Still. This is from a maniac. This is from someone else. I'm going to put this one into this one, this one into that one. Let's see if they behave differently. One by one, regardless of the diagnosis of the patients, the guinea pigs started dying. Well, yeah. So he did post-mortems on every damn one. And as they died, he got more animals and he just kept on going. Is, is he thinking that maybe they don't need someone's urine in their... Whereabouts is it landing in their abdomen? I don't know, just abdomen. There's not a lot of it, but yeah, in the gatocular region. So apparently um, he was also, a uh, quote from his biographer, uh, he was well aware that what he was doing was remarkably crude. So at first he kept quiet about his work, telling mm. only a few people... Mm. That's cool. ...who needed to know. I'm doing some secret <laughs> shed science. Like, seriously... What are you doing in there? <laughs> um, in, it, look, it's, it, look, it's not like I'm injecting piddle into your <laughs> guinea pig guts. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be crazy. <laughs> I'm making a bomb. Okay, cool. Look, just as a warning sign, listener, if any member of your family is, mm. uh, first of all, storing urine in their That's fridge. In your fridge. In your fridge. Yeah. And then they're doing secret experiments in the shed that they can't tell anyone, it's not really science. And, and there's a mountain <laughs> of dead guinea pigs out the back slowly accruing... <laughs> He, he at least pretended it was science because he could have just been doing it anyway. He's writing. He's at least writing things down. Yeah, he's writing notes. Although later, uh, later on, it said his his notes might not have been too easy to replicate the experiments. <laughs> yeah. So early experiments suggested the urine from manic patients was more toxic than urine from other patients and killed more guinea pigs. Mm. But it turns out that wasn't really true. Okay. So the urine from a manic patient was no more no more likely to kill a guinea pig than any other sort of urine. So he started thinking, well, what if what? I did something different? No, no. What's in urine? Well, yes. What? Did we not know? Well, urine's probably too crass. Maybe he needed something more refined. Okay, yeah, okay. All right. Urine light. Urine extract of urine. What's he going to do here? So there's two toxic substances that were of interest, urea and uric acid. Not the same, both in urine. But they both start with ur. Yeah, or they all three. Urine, urea, uric acid. you right. So they're both breakdown products. They're part of a body metabolism, blah, blah, blah. And he was thinking maybe one of them is the chemical toxin he was looking for. So maybe there's more urea in manic urine than in urine of patients with other mental conditions, but when he tested the idea, he found manic urine had no more urea than any other urine. I'm gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. Oh, I, re- I really thought this would be the thing. It's troubling. Their urine was too uriny. Yes, you have too like, much wee in your You've got wee. powerful urine. Too much piddle in your twinkle. So then he thought maybe uric, urea and uric acid might work in tandem to make the urine of manic this patients is This is the toxic. most classic. You know, the, you know the, it's, I think it's an Irish proverb. Why was the drunk man looking for his keys under the, under the light post? And he said, well, I can't see anywhere else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> where else would I look? This is where it starts to get interesting. So he wanted to make up different strengths of uric acid that he could convert into a substance that he could more easily manipulate. All right. But on its own, uric acid doesn't dissolve in water. So he added lithium to it. <laughs> 
which gave him lift look, in look obviously listener you know the end of the end as well L- like <laughs> like Jesus what a lucky fucker like he just I took at uh, one moment in his life he took well why don't I randomly add the thing that's gonna help <laughs> I told you it was about Luffy eventually. I'm going to play around in someone's poo, basically. Okay, yeah. it's not their poo, but not far off. I'm just going to play in the paddling pool of and poo. And it stinks a bit, so I'm going to put some rose water under my nose. And rose then, water's uh, the magic. <laughs> well, it's like he, he accidentally in, interjected antibiotics into yeah. into the poo. And yeah. it's like, Jesus yeah. Christ. And he was using it as a catalyst. Oh, my God. I realize, yeah. Look, I, I yeah. will, in his defense, I'm assuming he documented this enough to then go, I have made a discovery. De- and that's, de- and that's a legitimate enough. discovery. Definitely but enough. Jesus, what a playing around in your poo way to do, make a discovery. Oh, there's a few more steps. <laughs> they weren't perfect. So we added lithium. That gave him lithium urate. And of course, because he was adding new stuff, he's a scientist, he had to check if lithium was causing any confounds. So he didn't He put it in a guinea pig? Yeah, he put lithium alone in and lithium carbonate solutions into the guinea pigs as well as lithium urate. And they all died again? No, so he'd put it in the pigs, the guinea pigs, and they become more docile. Okay. And he said in one description, he simply lifted one guinea pig, one of the guinea pigs, he turned it over, placed it gently on its back after he'd injected it, and instead of fighting to stand up and basically get out of this entirely vulnerable position, it just kind of went, uh, that's cool. It's just blissing out. Just lay there, yeah. All right. And he did it again and again, he got the same results. So his quote was, they would lie on their backs, staring with soft eyes, while he gently prodded them with a stub of the index finger. He'd never seen them behave like this before. They seemed alert, but they were calm. <laughs> Hang on, does, is he missing, like... A chunk of his index finger. No, this is described as stub. I assume they just mean... I was just kind of visualising yeah. him as a dude Oh, yeah, he only had one hand as well. <laughs> and and a, he had a <laughs> limp and he spoke like a pirate. <laughs> Didn't I mention that? You should have done. I thought some crazy, crazy shit happened during the war and he's, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. he's just got stub fingers to do his science with. Most, most people Listener, if you have stub that. fingers, that's awesome. I'm, I'm celebrating stub fingers. I just like to visualise this. You're celebrating stub fingers. I am. Not that I do it myself. I'm just saying. God, you're a diverse person. I'm just saying that he's <laughs> if he's prodding with just the one knuckle of his finger knuckle. and he's doing all his science with yeah. one knuckle. Yeah. Look, if that is the case, it didn't come up, which you'd think it would. It, it should. So the next step to him was obvious, um, and the quote from his biographer, because he was a man of great honour and he was very religious, so he was worried that he couldn't do this to humans, so he started swallowing lithium himself first. Did he? For a few weeks. Okay, and so he wants to check if it's, if it's got negative side effects. He's going to fuck people up. So the quote is, and he didn't die, he didn't curl up in a ball in the corner, and he didn't have fits, so he decided it was okay to give to patients. And he knew who his first patient would be. Oh, really? Yeah. Bill Brand, he's, obviously. He's got some sort of guinea pig looking patient. Yes. <laughs> <He's got laughs> multicolored skin, quite furry. Uh, Bill Brand, he was a psychotic who'd, uh, for more than 30 years. He was a patient at the asylum in Bandura for most of the 30 years mm-hmm. that they knew him. He used to rummage around in rubbish bins at the asylum. He was manic. He'd try to spend all the money he had. He'd abscond if he got anything. So he was, he was a flight risk. Um, his life was the quintessential life of a seriously mentally ill patient. He'd cut off the tips of two fingers while working as a labourer. Stubs? Yep. Not Cade, though. He was disowned and alien, alienated from his family, and he'd just been left in the asylum because they okay. didn't know what to do with him. So the guy was fucking sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was not a well guy. So in March of 48, 1948, Cade put Brand on some lithium. He didn't He didn't put it in some urine first and then inject it. Into his it. gut. Yeah, guinea pig urine, though, to bounce it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the quote to get from the biographer. A man with a strong moral compass, Cade felt this was the ethical thing to do. What? To give this guy lithium. Because the guy was almost certainly going to die a miserable death alone. There was nothing much to lose because he was already having a shit Oh, yeah, life. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. He's fucked anyway. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So let's just fuck him faster, maybe. There were no ethics committees back then, so he was only answerable to his own conscience. Oh, look, and I don't... Uh, there are still uh, situations in society where someone is sectioned and they can have uh, medicine yeah. given to them without their consent because they're not able to give some sort of consent. And yeah, supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What, what are you going to do? He, was, what are you gonna he, do? He, he couldn't say no. I got, I got a barrel of guinea pig urine here. What am I going to do with it? Yeah, it's got it's to get somewhere. Plates. Yeah. Might as well give it to this guy. So he made a, a liquid lithium solution, and over, over three weeks as he fed it to him, Brand started to get better. So his speech stopped being manic. He stopped rummaging in the bins. So apparently after about two months, Brand, our, our buddy from the, oh, the psychotic, yeah. walked out of the asylum, back to his old job, perfectly sane. Two months. Wow. Two months. Um, and they said, look, basically nothing like this had been seen. In and they said his old job was the rummaging through the bins? Or not? There no. was a labourer was... where he lost a couple of oh, fingers. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the psychiatrist who wrote this biography said, in many ways, Bill's story is archetypal 
of many mental health sufferers. So he returns to his old job because he's well. And because he's well, he decides... And he's well to, forever now. He's, well, he's, that's it. He said, well, I'm well now. I don't need the medication. Oh. Uh, this happens a lot. So he gets sick again, gets yeah. bipolar again, gets goes back to hospital. So when he gets back, Cade goes, well, fuck me, lithium work. Let's give him more and more and more to get him back to normal. Yes. But too much lithium is toxic. Ah, uh, okay. And so in the late 40s, they didn't know what the correct dose would be because sure, it's experimental. Okay. Sure, sure. So Brand got lithium toxic basically and died in 1950. Ah, oh, all right. Yeah, which really fucked Cade up. So Cade was really freaked and he went, I, I, don't, I don't like this anymore. And he wasn't sure about whether it was. It was, it was a pretty big hint, though, it's that hint. Um, something yeah. went right. And I mm. get that Brand was having a bad life and mm. it ended badly, no mm. doubt. And it, it says, look, so in parallel with Brand, or maybe Brand was the first, I'm not sure, it wasn't clear, but Cade had treated 10 people with mania. And he wrote this up. He actually did publish something. There you go. So in late 1940, Journeys into guinea pig wee. Yeah. Et cetera, and then right, very right, right down the fridge piddle I've kept. Yeah. In September, he, he, he reported these dramatic improvements and he put it in the Medical Journal of Australia. Oh, there you go. September, sorry, 1949. The majority of the patients had been in and out of Bandura for a number of years, but now five had improved enough to return home to their families. So that was good. Five out of 10, which mm -hmm. is better than none. Okay. Um, the I, yep, the, I'm not going to quibble. They didn't quibble. Well, you know, half quibble. of them, and also they'd been in and out already. Yeah. So, like, yeah. the, and so five your, of them your, continued with the in and out. You and your facts and your knowledge and your actual observations of reality. True, though. But, yeah, five, five out of ten is better than none out of ten, and none out of ten was more common. Okay. So 50% improved, which is it's great. Um, but the paper went largely unnoticed, and in 1950, he abandoned lithium experiments. Oh, did he really? Yeah. He just went, oh, fuck it. It's too dangerous. I killed a dude. I don't like it. No one, okay, no, I, no one look, liked my paper. No, no, I get the I, get the, yeah. I killed a dude. And yeah. no one gave a shit about my paper, so whatever. But he, so he started experimenting with salts of rubidium, cerium, strontium. Uranium. Strontium's yeah, radioactive. Yeah, rather. But none of them apparently proved to be therapeutic. I'll get to the end in a moment. But as an aside, Kate, much later in his life, he said he realized that the guinea pigs were probably becoming calm because it was a, a, a side effect of toxic amounts of lithium anyway. It's this passive lying around. So uh, yeah, okay. even, even then it was likely that maybe the reason it seemed to be working yeah, okay. was oops as well. <laughs> it's all, all so much oops. So anyway, um, in the 1960s, his discovery was actually heralded as something really good. How'd this happen? I'll wander into it. So I'll, I'll get to the, where lithium is today to close this out. But um, he did this amazing thing, but he was very quiet about it, say his biographers. He wrote a book on the history of psychiatry after he retired. There was a chapter on lithium, and he didn't mention that he was the individual who discovered the miracle of lithium and how it could help people with bipolar. That is weird. It is weird. That's weird. Yeah. It's like... Uh Maybe maybe he was still like uh, look, I kind of did all right. Maybe he's weird. feeling a bit guilty, but yeah. don't don't write the chapter if you're feeling a bit guilty. Or maybe I was lucky and it was a history of psychiatry, so he's just like, look, it that works. That is now. so weird. Yeah, he didn't do it. Well, allegedly, again, he was a, a humble guy. So he died in 1980, November 1980, mm. and there are heaps of honours. Like so, there, there's a uh, psychiatric areas uh, around the hospitals in Australia are named after him. There's a National Health and Medical Research Council couple of grants called the. Um, NHMRC John Cade Fellowship in Mental Health Research. Oh, cool. 750 grand a year for uh, two of them. Uh, the Guinea Pig Society? Yes, the Guinea Pig Society. And the Urine, Urine Appreciation Society? What no, did they say? They got a photo of him. It's like the Rotary Club and the picture of the Queen. That's what they're like. <laughs> Urine Keepers Anonymous? Yeah. So he's, he's well acknowledged, he's well liked and well considered. What about lithium? Where are we at? Yeah. Where, where's lithium end up? So an Australian source, obviously, called lithium the, quote, penicillin story of mental health. And I can see that because yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. accidental oopsie poos, let's keep trying, holy shit, something worked. Mm, mm. Which penicillin I'm summarising, but it was pretty much... Of, of a similar type. Like yeah. that. Collecting a whole bunch of urine and then you... And you forget to wash your dishes, boom, and I've, then suddenly, I've cured yeah. things. Um, but another source says we need to acknowledge the Danish psychiatrist, Mogens Schau, who also fought long and hard to get lithium accepted as a treatment for bipolar disorder. Since the early 50s. So, yeah, he and a buddy found it. They got into it. They did double blind placebo controlled clinical trials. Oh, they did actual science? Yeah, they did real hardcore science. And did they do like a little bit of guinea pig injecting on the side just, just, to, just to keep the tradition? <laughs> like, you know, we did some proper science and some guinea pigs. Just, just in case there was something Cade missed because maybe we can help animals too. <laughs> So in, the 19, in 1970, in The Lancet, they published a paper that established beyond doubt that lithium was effective for most people with bipolar. 
That's so wild. it took till 1970. Yeah. And so basically people who Lord uh, Cade is the only guy say, look, we've got, to, we've got to be aware of these other two dudes as well, at least. Okay, fair enough. So thanks to them all. It's easy to manufacture it. The, the element was never patented by pharmaceutical companies, so it's cheap and available. Oh, you can't patent an element. No, you can't. That would be rude. Well, I don't think you can. I mean, no. I mean God maybe. Um, God already holds the Or the, the nature man. of the universe. God, God holds all the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But God, God's like a, a creative commons sort of guy. <laughs> I think he is. Like, I reckon you're right. Do, nearly, do what you like. Do I nearly like. spat my delicious Bruni Island waste out all over oh, the yeah. microphone. So lithium, of course, isn't perfect. There are side effects. What? It's not perfect? I actually... How could this be? I actually, years ago, worked in an area where I, I was interviewing a bunch of people who, for research purposes, who were suffering greatly from bipolar and deep depression. Yep. And the ones who were on lithium, the side effects, particularly, it was horrible to see uh, the women, were very large. And oh, okay. Uh, a lot of them had thinning hair, uh, which is yeah. some of the side effects. Like you do, it's it's non Some people pay, yeah, yeah. But you also get, you know, like hand tremors, frequent urination, thirst, stuff like that. That's there you not go. common. <laughs> it can cause irregular heartbeat. How, how frequent are you talking? Because because you know, the there's 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 times and days where I'm like I feel like I got that like side that. effect anyway. Yeah. Well, we'll stop taking so much lithium. <clears throat> yeah, there are, there are a lot of potential side effects. Kidney disease can happen. You can get too much calcium in the blood. Blah 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 blah. blah. Mm. So if it doesn't work for you, it can be a problem. But if it does work for you, it's life changing. So today, there was a piece in Nature in 2019 that said lithium helps to stabilise the moods of millions of people with bipolar disorder today, but you have to be careful because of the side effects, so you've got to be very dose aware, and its mechanisms are still a mystery. That's the thing. Yeah. I love that. It's that's, classic that's psychiatry. We, it works, but we have no but, idea But why. even more than classic psychiatry. Yeah. It's super, super simple as an element. Like, it's it's yep. as simple yep. as you can get. There ain't well, nothing to it. Close it, enough. It's like there's only two elements simpler, and and then yep. it works. That is so weird. Like, every other yep. chemical that, yep. that we have that we take, you know, you look at those chemical diagrams, they're huge, and they interact weirdly yep. with the cells and, and with yep. molecules. Yep. This thing's tiny. This one's like, it's a really dumb, simple thing, and we put it in there, and, and it seems to mostly work. So, so we don't even know? No, they speculate. Oh, you know, something to do with the functioning of neurotransmitters, blah, 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 but like, blah, blah, blah. And um, here, here's my favourite, which kind of brings us back to the natural spas, etc. So in July of last year, 2020, uh, there was a study published in the British Journal of Psychiatry that talked about how uh, public drinking water with trace levels of naturally occurring lithium seems to have anti-suicidal effects on the population who consume it. Yeah. So there was a systematic review, a meta-analysis of a whole bunch of studies from Austria, Greece, Canberra, Italy. Canberra, Canberra. Uh, Canberra. No, Lithuania, UK, Japan, US, a lot of countries. Yeah, okay. And it correlated, correlated, uh, naturally occurring lithium levels in drinking water samples and suicide rates in 1,286 regions or counties in these areas. See, that's a lot. Once you that's get a correlation a that big, uh, you know. You yeah, can, it's you a can... lot. And, and it shows clear um, a clear situation where the, the suicide levels – are lower in those with the Should we put lithium in the drinking water? So, but there's not a lot. It's far below clinical levels of lithium. Yeah, sure. So hints. Yeah, well, should we put a hint? Yes, with the fluoride. Wave some lithium. Lithium around. fluoride. There you go. That's what we need in our water. So, yeah, that's what we're looking at with lithium. It definitely does stuff. I think it's so weird, though, like, like that it is such a simple, like an atom. Mm. It's an atom, not, not even a molecule, not mm. even this complicated thing, and yep. yet it does something. Yep. I get why he's humble, though. Because he's embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little bit like the penicillin story. I get, you yeah, know, it's yeah. a bit. Um, it's like, uh, yeah, look, it was. I was doing some dumb science. Uh, I love, not dumb, but no, dumb. It was creative, dumb, <laughs> dumb science, and I stumbled across something that well, is actually awesome. I love it as a, cut, awesome. it a cutting agent. It's like you know, you don't talk about the gin. You talk about the uh, tonic water. Oh yeah, it turned like, out to be the tonic, not the gin, that was making the difference. Uh, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and awesome to contribute to the world by falling ass over backwards into discovering something that helps so many people. Absolutely. But, uh, <sighs> there you go. Awesome. Thank you, Nirvana, who, who I met. Did I tell you that? Tell I did hear that you met yeah. Nirvana. Are you going to tell the story of that, or is that in your other podcast? That's another time. Oh, my God. You should tell the story in your other podcast. It's called The Forge. One day it will be released. Oh, my God. Wait, you just put it out. The Wholesome Show... It's this podcast. It's me, Will Grant, and him, Rod Lambert. So this weird thing with his name. He says super long name at the beginning of the podcast. And then nothing. And at the end, he's like, no, you've heard my name. You can't hear it again you know to reinforce. Sh- you know how shy I am. <laughs> to reinforce my name. <laughs> so The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Guinea pigs. We'll be back next week, listener. <laughs> <laughs>